Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to Gaston Hall. My name is Amelia Irvin, and I am the Director of Sponsorship for the conference this year. I hope, I hope you all enjoyed the breakout sessions and your lunch. I now have the pleasure of welcoming to the stage Dr. John J. DeJoya, the President of Georgetown University, who will present the Reverend Thomas King Award. Thank you very much, Amelia, for your introduction and for your service on the Cardinal O'Connor Conference Board of Directors. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to welcome so many of you to Georgetown and to Gaston Hall, one of our most beautiful and historic places on our campus. And I wish to express my appreciation to all of the student volunteers on the Cardinal O'Connor Conference Board, especially co-directors Michael Kahn and Julia Greenwood for their many efforts to organize this year's conference, which is now in its 18th year. I wish also to express my appreciation to all the sponsors of the conference, especially our Georgetown Right to Life organization, the Knights of Columbus, and the Catholic Daughters of the Americas. We're so grateful for all that you've done to make today possible and to honor the legacy of His Eminence, John Cardinal O'Connor, a member of the Georgetown class of 1970 for whom this conference is named. It's a special, a special pleasure to be here with you today to present the ninth annual Reverend Thomas M. King SJ Award. This award has special resonance for me. Father King was the very first Jesuit and first faculty member I met when I came to Georgetown more than 40 years ago as a first year student. He helped introduce me to the way of life of our community and to the kind of academic work that was possible. I remember being right here in this room in 1981 when I was in graduate school. And he, at that time he convened an international conference on Teilhard and the unity of knowledge that brought together some of, some of the most extraordinary leaders in the academy and beyond. It was my first real exposure to the work of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, of whom Father King was a devoted scholar. More importantly, it was the first truly academic conference I had ever attended, and it was an example for me of the caliber and quality of academic work that an institution can do. During his time in our community, which spanned 41 years, and many generations of Georgetown students, Father King served as professor of theology, was a scholar, a distinguished author, a mentor, and friend. He had a special relationship with our student Right to Life organization, played a significant role in their efforts to host this conference each year, and shared a deep understanding of the dignity of every human life. His dedication was recognized in 2005 when he received the Rupert and Timothy Smith Award for Distinguished Contributions to Pro-Life Scholarship from the University Faculty for Life, an organization that he co-founded 16 years earlier in 1989. Father King was a comforting presence who played an enduring role in the lives of so many members of our Georgetown community especially those who joined him at his daily 1115 Mass in Dahlgren Chapel in our quadrangle. For 40 years, six evenings a week, during both moments of celebration and sadness, he presided and offered guidance to all who sought peace in the presence of the Lord. In 1999, our student newspaper, The Hoya, named Father King as Georgetown's man of the century, sharing that, quote, no one had had a more significant presence on campus and effect on students than Father King, close quote. There are so many images and memories that I have of him, but I always think of the way that he ended every mass in a quiet prayer from the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. 
When I think of Father King, I think of his gift of providing the opportunity in countless ways, but especially every evening at our 1115 Mass for our community to come together and to experience the presence of God. Father King had a wonderful spirit and patience. He was a person of extraordinary integrity and a model of what it means to be a man for others and a man for God. So it's wonderful to be with you this afternoon and to have this opportunity to remember his contributions. And I have the honor of announcing this year's Reverend Thomas M. King S.J. Awardee. And it's the Holy Cross Students for Life at the College of the Holy Cross. And Eleanor Riley, who serves as the group's president, will be accepting the award on behalf of the Students for Life and will be joined by her colleagues, Juliana Holcomb and Stephanie Raymond. So Eleanor, Juliana, and Stephanie, please join me on stage. You have our most sincere congratulations. Thank you, President DeJoya, and congratulations to Students for Life at Holy Cross. Now that you all have had the opportunity to hear Lila Rose, as well as hear our breakout speakers discuss a variety of arguments articulated by the pro-life movement, we turn to the highly anticipated conference panel discussion. Our panel discussion this year will directly address the theme of the conference, irreligiously pro-life, the future of the movement in a secular world. Before we move into the panel discussion, we would like to remind all of you yet again of our speech and expression policy. Georgetown University is committed to standards promoting speech and expression that foster the exchange of ideas and opinions. While it is recognized that not everyone may share the same views as the speakers, it is expected that everyone in attendance at this event respect the right of the speakers and of our conference board to share their per perspectives and ideas by not causing a disruption to the event's activities. At the conclusion of the panel, there will be a question and answer session during which you may ask questions and engage in dialogue. Please be sure to phrase your comments in the form of a question. In the interest of time, we ask that each person be concise and ask only one question. It is now my distinct honor to introduce to you the members of today's panel. We want to first welcome to the stage Richard Dorflinger. He is the former Associate Director of Pro-Life Activities at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, where for 36 years he researched and drafted policy statements and delivered congressional testimony on abortion, euthanasia, and other medical moral issues for the Bishops' Conference. His syndicated column, A More Human Society, is distributed to Catholic periodicals twice a month by the National Catholic News Service. He is a public policy fellow at the University of Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture and was the first recipient of the uni university's Evangelium Vitae Medal, awarded by Notre Dame's Fund to Protect Life for his work defending the sanctity of human life. Our next panelist is Mary Everstadt. She serves as a senior research fellow at the Faith and Reason Institute in Washington, DC, and is the author of several books, including It's Dangerous to Believe, Religious Freedom and Its Enemies, and How the West Really Lost God, A New Theory of Secularization. Her essays and reviews have appeared in many publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Time, and First Things. Center stage will be our panel's moderator, John Carr. He serves as the director of the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life here at Georgetown, which is an initiative that seeks to share Catholic social thought more broadly and deeply and reach out to a new generation of leaders. Carr previously served as the Washington Correspondent of America and wrote the Washington Front column for the magazine. Additionally, he has served for over 20 years as the Director of the Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, 
where he assisted the bishops in sharing Catholic social teaching and directing their public policy and advocacy efforts on major domestic and international issues. Our third panelist is Kelsey Hazard. She serves as the founder and president of Secular Pro-Life, which brings together people of every faith and no faith in defense of the human right to life. She was raised in the pro-choice United Methodist Church and is now an atheist. She has appeared in media outlets from Slate to the Weekly Standard, and you might recognize her too, from the pro-life documentary film entitled 40. She holds a law degree from the University of Virginia School of Law. Last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Marguerite Duane. Dr. Duane is a board-certified family physician and, co and is co-founder and executive director of FACTS, the Fertility Appreciation Collaborative to Teach the Science, which is a project of the Family Medicine Education Consortium. She also serves as an adjunct associate professor here at Georgetown, where she directs an introductory course on natural methods of family planning. Dr. Duane also works with Modern Mobile Medicine, a direct primary care house calls based practice serving patients in DC. In the past, she has also served as the medical director of the Spanish Catholic Center of Catholic Charities. She received her medical degree from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Let's have a round of applause for all of our panelists today. And now, without any further ado, John Carr, if you would like to start us off. Oh, great. Well, it's great to be here this afternoon. What a great day. Uh, Julia has introduced us, and uh, I just want to thank her and Michael and their colleagues for the remarkable work. There are a lot of wonderful things that happen at Georgetown, but I think the Cardinal O'Connor Conference is one of the most amazing. I mean, student-run, student-led, paid for. It's just a stunning example of faith in action, and uh, principled leadership. So it's just stunning. Julia, in addition to being a leader in the Cardinal O'Connor Conference, has been a leader in our initiative on Catholic social thought and public life, and we're very grateful to that. Hope some of you might have an interest in that. We do major dialogues similar to this. We do convenings, and in particular, we reach out to young leaders in Washington, if that describes you. We'd like to hear from you. We're doing something on the 29th of June in the Capitol about uh, uh, the practicing civility and pursuing the common good in a divided nation. It, uh, given the circumstances, it ought to be a very interesting discussion. So if you're interested, please get in touch with you. I had the great honor to work with Cardinal O'Connor. He was one of a kind. He was larger than life. Uh, he had a passion for the poor. Uh, he defended the rights of workers, but he began with the defense of the most vulnerable in our midst, the unborn, and he was just tenacious. And I think he would be so proud of what has gone on for almost 20 years. Um, I'm sure you're tired of old people telling you how inspiring it is to have so many young people. Uh, <laughs> Some of us used to say, uh, you are the future of the pro-life movement, or you're the future of the church, or you're the future of this nation. No, you are the pro-life movement, and you're why we're gaining ground. So one more old person, me, wants to say uh, thank you for being here yesterday and today. I have been, Richard and I, we were talking, we worked together uh, for more than 25 years at the Bishop's Conference. I came shortly after Roe v. Wade to Washington. Uh, I was not at the first March for Life, but I think of the 45, I've probably been to about 40. And uh, what Nellie Gray created is just stunning and a tribute in every way. But I have to admit that in the beginning, I went more out of a sense of obligation. Uh, our cause was right, but uh, to be honest, the spirit was pretty down. Uh, the, we seemed beleaguered in some ways. And uh, it grew and grew and grew, and it mostly grew because of young people coming and because of a sense of inclusion. What Jean Mancini and her colleagues have done uh, the slogan used to be, I think Richard w uh, would remember this, was no exceptions, no compromise. 
which was sort of a, uh, an internal dispute within the pro-life. And yesterday we marched under the banner of Love Saves Lives, and everyone was welcome. And uh, it seems to me our movement is now the inclusive movement. Our movement is the forward-looking movement. Our movement is the movement of love. And others are left to complain <coughs> about how things are. And I think we'll see tonight, this afternoon, uh, why that is. Uh, you know some of the facts. Uh, young people are more pro-life, pro and they're less religious. Young people uh, who care about the unborn are more engaged and active than those who are on the other side. But this movement, which in many ways, for many of us, I'll, for me to do an irreligious panel, my faith is at the core of what I do and why. Without my faith, I'm a really selfish person. I really admire people uh, who do the right thing uh, without faith. So I may not be the, the right guy. But it, how do we keep moving forward? I think in very difficult political circumstances, not everything was great yesterday, at least in my mind. But how do we engage, how do we persuade in an increasingly secular environment? And so I want to begin with a very general question to our panel. How does the pro-life movement move forward or adapt to an increasingly secular world? How do we promote a commitment to human life and dignity among both believers and non-believers? And let's begin with Kelsey. Well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. This may sound a little cliched, but I think in order to understand where we're going forward, we first have to understand where we have been. And Lila made a really interesting point uh, in her keynote this morning that abortion is not inherently a religious issue. You know, it's not enough to say that abortion is considered a religious issue just because Catholics talk about it a lot. You know, Catholics talk about any number of things, uh, immigration, capital punishment, and yet you know, reporters on those issues don't automatically think to stick it in the religion section. Uh, so what is it about abortion that is different? What has, what has led abortion to be ghettoized as a religious issue exclusively? Um, and it turns out the answer to that question is really interesting. Uh, it was a historical, uh, a tactic used by the early abortion movement. Um, I'm willing to bet that many of the people in this room are familiar with the name Bernard Nathanson. Uh, but for those who are not, he, um, he was an abortion activist uh, in the early days of that movement, in the late 60s, early 70s. He was an abortionist himself. Uh, he was an atheist, and he... Um, committed many abortions uh, after legalization and then wound up uh, coming over to our side thanks to ultrasound technology uh, and decided to uh, reveal some interesting tidbits about the way that the abortion movement operated and what their strategy was um, to get uh, Roe v. Wade handed down. Um, so I'm going to re read a short quote from him. I hope um, you'll forgive me for reading it off my phone. But this is what he had to say, one of the early abortion movement's strategies. He said... We systematically vilified the Catholic Church and its socially backward ideas and picked on the Catholic hierarchy as the villain in opposing abortion. This theme was played endlessly. We fed the media such lies as, we all know that opposition to abortion comes from the hierarchy and not most Catholics. And polls prove time and time again that most, most Catholics want abortion law reform. And the media drum fired all this into the American people, persuading them that anyone opposing permissive abortion must be under the influence of the Catholic hierarchy, and that Catholics in favor of abortion are enlightened and forward thinking. An inference of this tactic was that there were no non Catholic groups opposing abortion. <coughs> the fact that other Christian as well as non Christian religions were and still are monolithically opposed to abortion was constantly suppressed, along with pro life atheists' opinions. Um, that wasn't their sole dirty trick, but it's one that's of particular interest to me as a pro-life atheist whose opinions constantly suppressed. Um, but, uh, so um, understanding the source of the stereotype uh, and where we, you know, how we got to the point that we are, I think these changing religious demographics uh, and generational changes really give us an opportunity to punch a big hole in that stereotype and take away one of the abortion industry's weapons. You know, if, if a political conversation is um, 
you know, relies on stereotypes, it's very easy for people to dismiss something without giving it another thought. When we break through those stereotypes, and as I say, we have a great opportunity to do so now, uh, that's when people actually start having to think about it and start to really dive in and, and decide what is the value of an unborn child? What are we prepared to do as a society uh, to protect those who cannot protect themselves? Kelsey, I, I read uh, how you came to found your organization and had to do with your first visit to the March for Life. And can you just share quickly that story? Certainly. Um, I came to the March for Life as a college student, and I loved it. But I also saw far more crucifixes and Virgin Marys than I had ever seen before in my life. Uh, you know, as I, as I said, I grew up in a mainline Protestant denomination, so it was all very foreign to me. Um, and I just thought, wow, you know, uh, uh, an observer who came into this not really knowing anything about it would probably think that this was a Catholic gathering. Uh, and it just sort of put the seed in my mind of starting an explicitly secular organization um, Relatedly, you know, I was running a, a pro-life student group on campus and it was difficult for us to find good literature. You know, you would have um, a pamphlet with really great descriptions of prenatal development and then like there'd be that verse from Jeremiah on the back. I'm like, oh, you ruined it. Uh, so, uh, so, so it started really as just like, okay, we're gonna put, put a little ragtag group together, make our own brochures and stuff. And it just, ex it was one of those build it and they will come things that's really exploded. It's fascinating. <laughs> Doctor. On this general question of how do we make our case in an increasingly secular world, is a big tent pro-life movement going to alienate some of our most faithful people or will a broader approach help us? You're, you're on the front lines in several ways. Yeah, um, yes, yeah, great question. I do think we need a broader approach and to a certain degree, we really need to let the science speak for itself. I mean. The, the good news is, is that we have the science on our side. We know science shows us that a genetically unique human being comes into existence at that moment of conception. And that occurs in the woman's fallopian tubes. And it takes seven to 10 days for that newly formed human embryo to implant into the uterine lining. And at 18 days, that heart starts beating. And in about five to six weeks, you can begin to detect um, signs of life on ultrasound. And ultrasound has opened up a window into the womb so we can see this living uh, human being sucking its thumb, moving, acting. You know, the science is on, its, uh, is on our side, which is why the other side is trying to suppress the science. Mm -hmm. The other side is trying to ban um, ultrasounds and, and make that something that, that we shouldn't have. But we have to stay true to the science. And, you know, the organization that I founded, although it's not a pro-life organization, FACTS is an organization that is rooted in the science. And I spoke earlier this morning, I talked about the greatest gift that every one of us has been given is the gift of our life, right? Without life, we have nothing. But what gave us this life? And that's the gift of our fertility. That is the gift of our ability to co-create a new human life. And the FACTS organization is dedicated to educating our medical professionals about the science of fertility and fertility awareness-based methods the term natural family planning is much more familiar, especially among a Catholic audience, but our goal is to show it's about much more than family planning. It's about appreciating the gift of fertility. You know, along with the lines of um, the, the other side attacking Catholics from the science, from the, from the Catholic perspective, that happens from the birth control perspective as well. I mean, they try to suppress, you know, anybody that believes in fertility awareness from natural family planning as well, you know, that's just the Catholic hierarchy, the patriarchal society. When in reality, when a woman and a man understands their fertility, that's what's truly empowering them. A pill designed to shut down the reproductive health system, that's controlling you, you're not in control. So at FACTS, we try to speak the truth from the science, what the science shows us about fertility and what the science shows us about the beginning of human life. And through science, this is how we can make our case. But we really need a consistent life ethic. It's not enough to be pro-life from implantation to birth, we need to be pro-life from conception or fertilization until natural death. <coughs> you know, so as a pro-life movement, you know, much of the focus has always been on ending abortion, but as a family physician, I chose to go into family medicine and I made the commitment and I took the Hippocratic Oath at the Temple of Aesculapius in, in Greece to care for people from, from conception until natural death. And we need to make sure 
we're following through with that consistent pro-life ethic from, from conception to natural death. And again, the science is on our side. So we need to lead with the science. And facts, we do that. Our organization is unique in that our advisory council, some of you may be shocked by some of the people on our advisory council because we've got somebody from the National Catholic Bioethics Center and somebody on the board of Planned Parenthood. And we bring them all together in a room and say, we're gonna talk about the science of fertility and fertility awareness-based methods. And what we're seeing is we're changing hearts and minds by leading with the science. Thank you very much. If you haven't seen it, there's a remarkable piece that was published by The Atlantic a couple days ago um, by Emma Green, who is doing tremendous journalism in this area. She's actually a Georgetown alum called Science is Giving the Pro-Life Movement a Boost. And uh, you might want to take a look at it. Mary, you have uh, taken a somewhat different approach. You've been thinking about this a long time. Uh, I have here an article uh, from First Things, The Zealous Faith of Secularism. While we're dealing with a more secular society, you have been awfully clear about the dangers of that society to faith, but also to fundamental values. How do we make our case in a secular society and, and not end up abandoning our values? There is a lot to worry about in secularization, but the one thing I don't worry about, John, is the future of the pro-life movement. Mm. And that's for three reasons. Uh, first, there's the fact that the logic of Roe itself uh, and the movement that has embraced it is so inhuman and unnatural, the human reason and the human heart continue to overrule it, even quite apart from the churches. Thanks to Roe, the US has one of the most extreme abortion regimens in the world. And abortion on demand unleashes just too many things that too many people can intuitively know are wrong. It permits gender side, for example, uh, the fact that millions more unborn girls are killed than boys. How feminist is that? It permits prejudice, it licenses prejudice against <clears throat> people with downs or people with club feet or people uh, with other disabilities. It empowers the strong and predatory. And again, the human heart rebels against these things and rebellion comes in pretty unlikely guises. How many of you have heard Eminem's new album, which was released last month? The track River is about a male narrator expressing his regret, his angry remorse, over an abortion. I happen to be a longtime admirer of Eminem. <laughs> he uses language very carefully. And in that song, you will not see the narrator talking in incoherent, excuse-making, vague language about reproductive freedom. It uses the word baby, it uses the words unborn child, and I'm not saying that this makes Eminem a poster boy for the pro-life movement, <laughs> but he's not the only example of where in the popular culture you find resistance to the idea that the blob of tissue theology holds. So for that reason, I think we can expect continuing rebellion, again with the aid of science, um, from places far outside of organized religion. <clears throat> and the second reason why I'm optimistic about the pro-life movement is one that many older people don't resonate to, but I think many younger people do. <clears throat> and that is the fact that we live in a time of increasing moral awareness about animal life. Its preciousness and its testimony to the magnificence of creation. More and more people now realize that our fellow creatures shouldn't be treated as a blob of tissues either. Think of the outrage a few years ago when Cecil the lion was killed for sport. Or of how elephants are now widely understood as stupendous creatures made for something apart from human entertainment. Or think of how many of us have become mindful eaters or vegetarians or vegans out of this new respect for animal life. Well, I think that rising moral consciousness is a great thing, and in my writing, I try sometimes to build a bridge between the people concerned about animal welfare and the people concerned about human animal welfare. 
I think a lot more of that could be done. And again, this is all work that can take place outside the churches. The third reason for optimism has been there all along, ever since Roe was decided. And it gets more apparent with every passing year. I thought of this a lot down at the March for Life yesterday. Everyone knows the pro-life movement has a youthful face, as John jokingly alluded to in the opening. But there's a deeper point about that connection between youthfulness and abortion. If you attend rallies by the other side, you will see that they are the reverse mirror image of the March for Life. There is no joy on the pro-choice side. There's grim determination, steely drive, and quasi-religious fervor. But there is no youthful energy and no happiness. If you didn't know what those two rallies were about, you would instinctively know which one you wanted to go to. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. In a minute. And that contrast in the end may spell goodbye to the embrace of abortion on demand just as much as a future Supreme Court might. In the matter of the human heart as opposed to the Constitution, there has always been something pitiable in the spectacle of austere, humorless adults, many of them barren, instructing boisterous youth in the dictum that babies are bad. The position of those elders is unnatural, and this too is something that even an unchurched child can spy. So in sum, 2,000 years of moral teaching by the Catholic Church do indeed explain all the reasons why life is good and why killing is wrong, but that these truths exist can be determined by reason, including very youthful reason, alone, and that, like life itself, is a good thing. Great. I've heard uh, Mary before, and she's always been eloquent. That's the first time I've ever heard her say she's a fan of M&M. &M. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't expect that. Uh, uh, Richard Dorfling and I are great friends, uh, allies, colleagues for many years. Uh, the, at the U.S. Bishops Conference, uh, the social justice people and the pro-life folks shared the floor. And outsiders often assumed that we were probably at each other's throats. And there were differences on occasion about priorities or tactics or the wording of a letter or the wording of another letter. <laughs> but uh, we had more in common than anybody else in the building. We had a shared mission. We, we really wanted to accomplish things. And uh, lots of people talk theoretically about a consistent life ethic. Uh, I think we lived it. Uh, I told the story in the green room that uh, when uh, Richard and I tag teamed up on the uh, hill during the Affordable Care Act, and uh, th they're incredible stories, and if you have a couple hours, I'll be happy to share them. But one story is we were meeting with a particularly unhappy fellow, and uh, we took it on and made the case. And when it was all over, he said, I would like to meet with your boss. He felt that we had not been uh, as civil and uh, wonderful as uh, he thought we should have been. And uh, Nancy Wisdo, our boss, came out, and we said, what was it? He said, a fat, bald guy with a beard, you know, pushed me too hard. And I said, what did you say? And she said, which one? <laughs> <laughs> well, I lost weight later. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Richard, <laughs> Richard was there longer, but I had a better title. Mm. Richard was head of... Well, associate director. Of associate director. Yeah, yeah. I was secretary of social development and world peace. <laughs> and I've told this story often, but I, I was on an elevator and I uh, had a name tag, and they could see. And the gentleman turned to his spouse and said, um, "He's in charge of social development and world peace." 
And she looked at me and said, you need to do a better job. <laughs> well, in fact, we need to do a better job, despite the optimism we described. One of the things, Richard, that always struck me about you is you work for the religious group that Dr. Nathanson went after, but you always insisted this was not a religious issue. I would write a letter and I'd quote the Old Testament, choose life, and Richard would say, this is not the place for that. It's going to the Congress. You have thought a lot about how we make the case for human life from its beginning to its end to, an, to a secular society based on our faith that doesn't require the faith of others. What are some of the lessons you've learned? What are some of the uh, things we ought to remember as the society, sadly, in my mind, becomes mm. more secular? Mm. Thank you. Uh, well, I, I think it's very easy for a Catholic to make secular arguments. That's our tradition is, you know, faith and reason uh, do not contradict each other. We embrace, we endorse the secular sciences. We'll take all their, uh, their findings and make use of them. And, and then there's this additional insight that sort of puts all of them in a different context. But you don't always have to talk about that different context because you need to start with premises that you know your audience shares. There are times when I've gone making secular arguments and it's the member of Congress who starts talking about religion and it's kind of interesting and they feel free to do that with someone they know is, is, uh, is a Catholic. Uh, once I was talking about conscience rights and this, this congressman said, well, you know, I'm, I'm a Catholic, I go to church, but you know, I, as an individual, I have faith, but I don't think an institution has a conscience. And I said, when you go to church every Sunday, don't you pray with me? Look not on our sins, but on the faith of our church. Oh, you know, so then I can make a churchy argument. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but the other reason is that, especially in the public policy arena that John and I worked in, both of us for so many years, is that, of course, if you do say uh, this law or this effort is, is based entirely on a religious argument, it's unconstitutional. It's an establishment of religion. Uh, but the Supreme Court has been really good about that because they said, you know, when the Supreme Court upheld uh, the ban on public funding of abortion, and the ACLU was making the argument that it was based on an establishment of the Catholic religion because it was against abortion. And the court said, look, you know, just because one of the Ten Commandments is thou shalt not steal, that doesn't invalidate all the laws against larceny. Uh, <laughs> And you know, as long as you also have a legitimate secular purpose, that's fine. And they said as a legitimate secular purpose in encouraging childbirth over abortion, uh, abortion, this is a quote, this is my, one of my favorite quotes in the Supreme Court, abortion is inherently different from other medical procedures because no other procedure involves the purposeful termination of a potential life. The only thing the court got wrong was that incoherent phrase, potential life, which mm -hmm. is actually unscientific. But the court in later years, later decisions, has actually said laws can be based on respect for unborn life. So, you know, let's go with it. You know, you guys think the Roe v. Wade is great because whatever the Supreme Court says is fine? Well, here you go. Uh, here are some challenges. One is uh, sometimes it doesn't even matter how secular your argument is. Because if they know you are a believer, uh, they will go after you on that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not, you know, it's all about identity politics these days. It's not about what you say, it's who you are. I, I went to, once to a very high level symposium on embryonic stem cell research and I knew these guys were mostly secular and I, I, I did, you know, the embryology textbooks about the embryo and the statements even by uh, advisory commissions that advise uh, pro-abortion presidents saying, yes, this is human life, we admit that, and so on. And at the end of it all, I made this very basic ethical argument that didn't have anything to do with religion. At the end of it, one of another ethicist gets up and says, well, Mr. Dorflinger has presented a very pretty facade, but we know where he's really coming from. <laughs> and uh, that's the problem. The problem is not so much secularism as bigotry uh, against anyone who also has a belief. And that is an enormous challenge. I've, I've recommended, uh, you know, with Congress, uh, Congressional Committee sometimes say, who do you want to have testify on this embryonic stem cell stuff? And I, you know, in the ethics and the science, I say some of our best people, one of them's right here at Georgetown, Kevin Fitzgerald has a PhD in 
bioethics and in genetics, I said, oh, we can't have a priest, no matter how good a scientist he is. They'll just assume it's just, you know, Catholic science. So that's an enormous challenge. Uh, you, you're not going to hide who you are or what you are, but uh, even if you make the best secular argument, you still may face a kind of discrimination. Another challenge is I don't think that religious arguments are on the decline. I think arguments are on the decline. You know, it's there, I mean, uh, uh, Bishop Barron actually has this nice talk that he gave to the, the staff at Facebook about called How to Argue About Religion. And he, what he meant by that is how to achieve actually arguing about it instead of just yelling at each other and, and, and dismissing each other. Uh, that's an enormous problem. And you know, nowadays it's all about emotion and it's about this identity politics. It's about, and the emotion is usually anger. Uh, and so you have to get through that in order to get to actually making arguments. Uh, and that gets me to my final point, which is the role of faith, the role of religion may be not in presenting the arguments, but in getting you to the point where someone might listen to an argument and where you might be able to stick around long enough to be willing to survive and make those arguments. I think I'm reminded of uh, Dr. Bernard Nathanson, who turned against abortion after 60,000 abortions when he was still an atheist, his, one of his favorite lines was, even if God doesn't exist, the fetus does. Uh, and he used to tell us, I'm more used to you as an atheist than if I were to become a believer. He became a Catholic eventually anyway, not because of the teaching. He already got it right about the moral issue. He joined the Catholic Church because he needed to find somebody who could tell him he could be forgiven. Uh, and so, you know, the, there are three things I think faith can add, uh, you know, value-added uh, <laughs> additions to the, uh, the pro-life argument. One is this, this and, and particularly I'm thinking of the Catholic tradition, others too though, this comprehensive vision of how all the uh, issues fit together in a way that is not found in either political party, uh, and that frees you from being beholden to coalitions and alignments that uh, don't make a lot of intellectual sense, and, uh, and that can entrap you in being associated with issues you don't want to be associated with. Uh, secondly is a sense of broader perspective, you know, looking at things from the viewpoints of eternity. Uh, the way that I stayed working in DC on these issues for 36 years without burning out or becoming bitter, and I saw other people become bitter, uh, like I kept remembering two phrases, Mother Teresa's, uh, God doesn't want you to be, he doesn't need you to be successful, just faithful. And the reminder that the ultimate victory over death has already been won and I'm just kind of catching up. Okay. Uh, and that put my own successes and my failures in uh, perspective. And finally, this attitude that everything you do is out of love and especially love for your opponents love for people involved in abortion, not only hate the sin, but love the sinner, but hate the sin because you love the sinner and you want what's best for them. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, and, and I think what was, was said about the, the marches is correct, joy and love. And eventually, uh, people will say, wow, look at those Christians, how they love one another. That's odd. You know, maybe I should find out more about that. But I think that's, that's what faith adds, is a perspective. It adds faith, hope, and love. And those might be more effective than any argument. Okay. The, uh, <laughs> Richard talked about how to have an argument without having an argument. There was one dimension that was implicit in everybody's uh, comments, and that was relationship. And I think that's particularly where young leaders in the pro-life movement have taught the rest of us a lot. Uh, you don't have some of the baggage, uh, some of the, the wounds or the scars. I, uh, I taught a course up at, a seminar up at Harvard. Uh, academics brag about that stuff. How I got to Harvard, I'll never know. When uh, we, it was, I, we told our kids that I was going to be a fellow at Harvard 
uh, our youngest son, Tim, said, are we talking the real Harvard? <laughs> you know, uh, uh, turns out what a fellow does is a fellow eats and talks, and Richard would tell you I'm good at those things. But at, at one of our seminars, I had a young Jewish kid who said, I don't like pro-lifers. I like you. Hmm. What's wrong with this? Tell me, why do you believe what you do? And I took out my phone and I said, I have a new grandson. I have a picture of him. Uh, he has a name. Uh, he has a room. Uh, we know his sex. Uh, he has clothes. He has godparents. The only thing he doesn't have is the right to be born in this country. And I showed him the picture of the sonogram, getting to the doctor's point about science. And he said, I've never thought about it that way. But the most important part of that conversation was I like you. The relationship matters. Richard also talked about politics, how we get trapped in the places we don't want to go. We've been talking about the cultural context. I'm going to talk for a minute about the political context. And as you can imagine, there might be two questions here. Uh, yesterday, for the first time, the President of the United States addressed the march. Some people thought that was just wonderful, about time. Look at what he's done. Other people were very unhappy. Uh, it was the same day he had rejected an agreement that would have given legal status to dreamers. You know, we're reading headlines about payoffs to porn stars. Uh, so what does it mean to stand up for what we believe in a Republican Party led by Donald Trump. Let's focus on that, and then I'm gonna ask a question about a Democratic Party that is increasingly secular. So, and I know there are a variety of views. I hope there are a variety of views. Kelsey, I've heard you talk a little bit about that. Why don't we start oh, yes. with you? Yes, you have. Um, I, am, I am not a fan of our Commander-in-Chief, and that's uh, not really a secret and probably not surprising to, to anybody in this room. Um, he. I think other presidents have addressed the March for Life, but through pre-recorded messages. Well, I think he was the phone. first to do it live. Okay, by phone. Uh, he was the first video live stream, you know, high tech um, there at the March for Life. And it, it terrified me that he was gonna be live. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, 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 uh, I, it wound up not being uh, as disastrous as I, I thought it would be in my nightmares. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a real weight around the pro-life movement's neck to have someone who um, clearly sees women as sexual objects, uh, which is uh, pretty starkly against our, our values as a movement. Uh, but, of course, Hillary Clinton also would have posed extreme problems for our movement, you know, particularly, um, you, you mentioned earlier, the, the issue of public funding for abortion. You know, I, I have friends who are alive today because of the Hyde Amendment, which is the, the prohibition on that public funding. Uh, Hillary Clinton exp expressed her desire to repeal that. Uh, so I was really faced with uh, an impossible choice, and I know a lot of people were. Um, so I. You know, when you're faced with a dilemma like that, I, I can't judge somebody who voted for Clinton and I can't judge somebody who voted for Trump because I know that you were, you, it was not, I, I mean, really in a nation of you know, over 300 million people, I can't believe those were the two best candidates we could come up with. I mean, I think the, I think the real, the, the real, <laughs> wow, thank you all. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think the, the real lesson here may be that we needed to get involved a lot sooner, that we needed to be involved in the primary process more than we would, that, that more than we were, uh, that we need to um, you know, be, cons if, if you're uh, interested and willing to take on all the burdens of it, maybe consider running for office yourselves. You know, be taking more control over the situation because the fall of 2016 saw us in a situation that was just out of control. Doctor, you're involved not only in our movement, in science, you're on the front lines. Uh, you were a leader in the Spanish Catholic Center, which provides essential health care to immigrants. What's your take on uh, 
the relationship of the pro-life movement to a party led by uh, this man? Yeah, it is a great question to address, and all I have to say is one of the benefits of living in Washington, D.C., as much as I'm a fan of the democratic process, really my vote didn't matter which way I chose to vote. Um, but it was, as Kelsey pointed out, a very, very difficult decision. Um, I will say, you know, first and foremost, you know, we're all sinners, and, and I really work very hard not to judge other people, although there's a lot that could be said about our current um, commander in chief. What I give thanks for is that um, in the administration he's put together and the people that he's chosen to surround himself with, you know, that has given me confidence that, you know, he, that, that the right people are being put in place to help move our cause forward. And, and, and I think that that highlights that this isn't about any one individual, right? This, this is a movement. It is a much greater cause than just the president. Um, and, and the fact is, is that he has, through his actions, through the administration he's put together, I think it has helped the pro-life movement, but I wouldn't necessarily give him the credit or, I mean, it's much bigger than him as an individual. He may not like to think about it because he likes to think it is all about him, <laughs> right? Um, it, you know, is, as, narcissistic, as narcissistic as he is, but I, I think I take comfort in the fact that he's put together a strong administration, um, even down, I mean, for the first time ever, I mean, the Title X Family Planning Office is about providing funding for family planning options. Fertility awareness-based methods is a family planning option. It is not offered. I'm actually gonna be testifying in a couple weeks on legislation in the state of Maryland for health insurance to fund fertility awareness-based methods. You know, this should be a part of the Title X Family Planning Office, and there was somebody in place that was actually working towards that and reaching out to me and saying, hey, how can you help us train doctors about these methods? And I thought, finally, it's not just about, you know, becoming a drug dispensary for the birth control pill through the Title X Family Planning Office. Like, there are actually people in place that are looking towards bringing real, authentic, truly female empowering healthcare options. So, you know, the administration is what it is. President Trump is who he is. I, am, I just take comfort in the fact in that the movement is so much larger um, than the president and will continue to grow in strength regardless of who he is. Marianne Richard, obviously in the short term, some bad things are not happening and some important things are. What are, what are the longer term implications of this identification? Jay, I hope well, they're minimal, but <laughs> <laughs> do you wanna talk about something? Uh, you know, I think, uh, I mean, it is, it is a problem. Though. Because of the president's, you know, rudeness and personal characteristics and so on, uh, there's a danger he uh, discredits the issue, even the good issues that he associates himself with. I think that's a challenge to us to identify those issues with uh, other people and, you know, to make it clear that when he does something good, it's because he finally listened to uh, somebody who is very decent and good and uh, uh, was pushing him into it. The, uh, I do think that the polarization is such now that it is radicalizing both parties. Uh, yeah. I, was, I was ashamed yesterday when I found that only, I'm a, I'm a pro-life Democrat, and I was ashamed that only six Democrats in the House voted for a bill to make sure that you can get care for a child who's already born alive, a constitutional person who is born because, uh, because of an abortion. Uh, and and the, the leader of the pro-life Democrats in the House being targeted by other Democrats for being killed off in his primary next time he's up for re-election. Uh, it's, uh, so it is, it's, it's now a poison that is in both parties. Uh, I think, you know, it's, it, but it gives the groups like the pro-life groups of the Bishops Conference an enormous opportunity, too, because, I mean, we'll work with anybody if, if they'll agree with us on pressing forward with an issue. Uh, you know, we had, uh, we had Orrin Hatch and Ted Kennedy co-sponsor a bill to provide more support and care and more positive counseling for parents who expect a child with Down syndrome. Uh, when I first came on board at the Bishop's Conference, the Director of Government Relations was Jim Robinson. Remember Jim Robinson? And between uh, drags on his cigarette, he said, he, he initiated me by saying, Richard, our policy is no permanent friends and no permanent enemies. Mm. 
And after a couple of months on the job, I said, the first one's working. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> on that note, we'll turn to Mary. Uh, just uh, two quick points. Uh, one, I signed, although I'm not much of a political activist, um, being a lowly writer type, but I did sign what I think was the very first never Trump mm -hmm. letter, which gives me street cred mm. to offer the following. Um, you know, I don't think as Christians we should rule out the possibility that he changed his mind somewhere on this issue, as many other people have had occasion to change their minds on this issue. Thank you. Good um, and then the second thing is, of the three arguments I made initially for optimism about the pro-life movement him itself, I don't think that this current commander-in-chief or any commander-in-chief uh, will be the fulcrum on which any of those arguments turn. So in that sense, I'm unconcerned. On a, on a panel that is irreligious and secular, it may be that Trump is an irreligious and secular man who, for whatever reason, was converted on this issue. I worry a lot about the long-term damage. I know I'm not a panelist. On the year of the 25th anniversary of the March on Washington with Dr. Martin Luther King, we in the Archdiocese of Washington decided we were gonna make a big effort around the March on Washington and the March for Life, particularly in involving African American parishes and, and getting white folks to come to the March on Washington, black folks to come to the March on Life. And it was terrific, it was a great experience. We had a special mass at, uh, what, well, what's the one, uh, St. Patrick's. We marched down to the march. It was, uh, the march is a lot of things. It isn't nearly as diverse enough as it needs to be. But there we were, we arrived at pre precisely the moment that the crowd was chanting, run, Jesse, run. And it was not Jesse Jackson, it was Jesse Helms. And that was not the Jesse Helms at the end of his career when he was working on AIDS patients. It was Jesse Elms who was still very much characterized by racial intolerance. And there were people who never again were gonna be a part of any pro-life thing. So these associations can hurt. Talking about associations, uh, the Democratic Party, in many ways, in my judgment, has lost power because it's lost its pro-life uh, members of Congress, but is, somebody said it's even more polarized than ever. Used to be safe, legal, and rare. Can't say rare. Can't say unfortunate. Uh, you have a Democratic Party chairman who, they used to lecture us about uh, you can't be single issue. Well, this is a single issue. What do we do to try and keep our movement from being used in a partisan way when an increasingly secular Democratic Party seems to barely tolerate a discussion of this? Let's go down the row again. Starting with me. Yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next few years because clearly there is a major internal fight within the Democratic Party about you know, whether or not to uh, basically excommunicate all of the pro-life Democrats from the party. I think they do so at their peril. I mean, we, um, as we began this conversation with, the, the trend lines are, are in our favor in terms of the, the, the demography and it's, uh, you know, that they're taking a big risk, I think, by uh, pr particularly in you know in states that that lean more pro-life, and um, you know if you look at uh, I, I uh, I'm very jealous of the pro-life movement in Louisiana, which seems to have a wonderful, robust, bipartisan um, uh, stage going on. Um, so I, you know I, I I wish I had the the magic solution. I don't. <laughs> Clearly, I don't. But I, I think that. You know, if you are a Democrat, the party needs to hear from you. You know, we, we can't afford to just curl up in a ball and say, oh, it's politics, that's too bad. The only way to, to solve it is to speak. Other comments, Doctor? Mary, Richard? Well, one thing, uh, taking off from what Mary said about street cred, uh, that's, that's one thing the churches have on, uh, on care for the poor, the, uh, the, the disenfranchised, the marginalized. Uh, so even, you know, the Democrats have to recognize that 
you have this enormous community of caring. Uh, Catholic Church is very prominent in it, others too. There are all these studies showing that, uh, for example, that religiously affiliated hospitals provide better care at lower cost than secular hospitals, public hospitals. Uh, same is true of, uh, of uh, helping uh, victims of human trafficking. And yet the Catholic Migration Refugee Services got kicked out of a major grant on that because they wouldn't do abortion referrals. So at some point, some Democrats may realize that they're, they're choosing between the best possible care for the people they claim to care the most about and this obsession with abortion. Mm. And I would hope that we would you know, constantly press them on that. Yeah. Uh, do you really want to throw out not only the baby with the bathwater, but the poor with the bathwater, and you know the people who can get all these wonderful services by saying that nobody's allowed to be pro-life. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Go ahead. I think one one thing that's needed is for the uh, the Democratic Party to walk away from a number of things, and abortion absolutism isn't the only one. There's also the fact that. Uh, the progressive wing of the party is responsible for attacks on Christian and other religious charities. And these are manifold. I'm talking about attacks by the state of California, for example, trying to shut down every emergency pregnancy center, mm -hmm. places where women can get diapers and sonograms and advice and material aid. And all of this hurting of the poor is being done in the name of progressive ideology. So what's needed is for a new generation of democratic leaders to grow a spine mm -hmm. and to say no to that, no to abortion, no to the stigmatization of Christianity, uh, and no to, to pornography money because the alignment between Hollywood and democratic fortunes is um, very strong. Uh, Hillary Clinton had huge fundraisers in Hollywood uh, the, the pornography money does not, uh, to my knowledge, flow into the Republican Party. What's needed are leaders yeah. who are Democrats who can say no to those things, because I think people like that could get a real hearing. The other, the, so what I was going to mention is, you know, in addition to the issue of abortion, Democrats tout themselves as they are the party of women, they are for the feminists. But the reality is, is there's a whole new wave of feminists rising up that recognize destroying the life within us does not make us better women. Mm -hmm. Shutting down our reproductive health system is not what empowers us. What empowers us is embracing, <laughs> embracing our God-given gifts as women, our ability to procreate, to gestate, to lactate, to nurture and raise children. And by, by, by focusing on abortion, they're going to lose so many women who see themselves as feminists but realize, you know, does it, to be a feminist, does that mean I need to be just like a man? That's not what makes us unique and strong and powerful as women. It's what, how we've been created as women. And so I think the Democratic Party does need a reawakening. And as Mary said, you know, their leadership needs to grow a spine. You know, certainly working with the immigrant population as I did, you know, as the head of the Catholic Charities Health Centers, you know, it was about caring for the poor and the underserved, and you know, that's very much a democratic issue, but they've lost focus on that. I mean, I testified against the HHS mandate before it was the HHS mandate, and my boss said, well, that's not important to us, you know, for our health center, and I thought, they could shut us down because as a Catholic health center, we're not gonna dispense birth control like it's a Pez candy, you know, and if they're, if they're gonna shut us down so I can't care for my diabetics who have, who have high blood pressure and heart disease because I'm not gonna hand out birth control to every woman that walks in the door. I mean, it's, it's very discriminatory against a larger population because they're so narrowly focused on the abortion issue. The, it seems to me as an observer here, uh, there's a shortage of spine throughout Washington. Uh, uh, I talked about Martin Luther King, one of the great things about yesterday's march in the mass was to hear Cardinal Dolan talk about Dr. King and that his dream and our dream. And a young woman from Alabama who I, whose name I don't know from Montgomery talked about Rosa Parks and whatever. Uh, when a president says there are good people on both sides, we need people to stand up 
and say no, and we need people in the pro-life movement to stand up and say no. My, I come from a bipartisan political family. Both my parents are Catholics, but my mother's from St. Paul and my dad from Minneapolis, big deal. <laughs> my Republican mother started the pro-life pregnancy center in our hometown, very conservative woman. Food stamps, WIC, and Medicaid were not the sources of all evil in our town. They were lifelines for uh, the babies we tried to help and the mothers we tried to help. And so we got Democrats in their cul-de-sac. We got Republicans who give us lip service and some policy, but we're not where we want to be. Sometimes we describe that as homelessness. I have two thoughts on that, and then I'll ask a question. Uh, one is, if you're homeless, you need to build a shelter. We need to build a sanity caucus in both parties that will stand up for human life and dignity. And secondly, uh, when I was young, I, I wanted to either be a priest or a senator, and I fell in love. That took care of the priest thing. <laughs> Although some of you ought to become priests or sisters. Uh, and I ran for office, state legislature, and I lost, and that took care of the Senate senator thing. Each of you ought to think about running. There are worse things than standing up for what you believe, running for office. I lost, you might win. Uh, I'm checking on time here. Uh, let me uh, ask one quick question and then we'll turn uh, to, to you. Uh, there's people in streets all over America, women especially. Part of the impetus for that is the Me Too movement. What is the overlap between uh, what Doctor was talking about and the Me Too movement? Women uh, who have been treated badly and a society that essentially says we have the solution for you and that's abortion. Is there an overlap? That's a good question. Um, I think definitely um, you know, when you, that when you look at you know who has has been accused credibly of of sexual assault and harassment, um, you do have some conservatives and some liberals and some abortion donors. You know people who are very much entrenched in that sort of you know some, we were saying earlier the Hollywood um, fortunes. So will that ultimately result in maybe more skepticism toward people who are funding the abortion industry? Perhaps more you know sort of connecting those dots that hmm, these, these abortion centers are being funded by people with really sketchy sexual histories and oh look, now they're uh, turning a blind eye to sexual abuse when people come into the clinic. I would love to see those dots be connected, but as you said, when, when we're tied to Trump, that becomes more difficult. Mary, well, you've thought about this. A little. I um, have said to my husband Nick several times, uh, just when you think God's not paying any attention to the way we're slugging it out down here, comes something like the Harvey Weinstein scandals. Mm. Because that is how perfectly those unfolding uh, scandals prove so much that's true, so much that's been ignored and denigrated in a secularizing world. Those scandals could not have happened on the scale that they happened without abortion on demand as an implied backup and without the idea that women are available 24-7. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that was a gift that we are only beginning to uh, exploit, I think. Jeez, Harvey Weinstein as a gift and the M&M <laughs> as a, <laughs> a, a teacher. I think this it gets back to the nature of the sexual relationship, right? I mean, our society teach sex as a recreational activity. I mean, sex, the sexual relationship, the marital relationship is the greatest gift that we've given because it allows us to join with one another to potentially create a new human being. We have completely separated this out. And this year marks the 50th anniversary of Humana Vitae, which I know, although I wasn't around then, I wasn't alive then, I know created a, a major schism within the Catholic Church, you know, with Pope Paul VI's teachings on birth control. Humana Vitae is one of the shortest encyclicals that is out there, and if you have not read it, I would encourage you to read it. And it will frighten you how prophetic this old white guy 
was about you know, the freedom, quote unquote, that birth control would allow, what that would lead to, and the destruction. Everything that that man predicted in Humanae Vitae has come true, and it is frightening. And what we need to do is we need to restore the value and the sanctity and the beauty of that sexual relationship. It's not a game or an activity or a recreational thing to be had at will by men whenever they want it. And through fertility awareness-based methods and natural family planning, the research has shown over and over again that couples who use those methods develop a healthy respect and a greater respect for the dignity of the person with whom they're in relationship. It all gets back to relationship and valuing the sacredness of the human relationship. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, there's a microphone in the middle of the uh, program, middle of the auditorium there. If you could come forward, identify yourself, and please put your question in the form of a question. <laughs> What's the directionality on that? Like, if, is, it, is it a matter of... Okay. Uh, we have trouble seeing up here because of the spotlight, so go ahead. Hello, um, thank you for coming. Um, Mr. Uh, Dorlfinger, I really appreciate what you said about identity politics. I think it's becoming really prevalent today, you know, um, with intersectionality and all this stuff that, you know, be some, somehow I'm the oppressor because of my gender and my race, I'm somehow the oppressor in society. So I think, um, how, how should we approach this in the secular world? How should we approach dealing with these issues of identity politics? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I identify as a child of God, and that's all I need, you know, but I, I'm, not, I'm not really sure, because it's a, <laughs> it's, uh, the, uh, you know, I think, for example, I mean, what, what um, uh, Marguerite was just talking about in terms of the real problem here is this distorted notion of what sex is for, that it's for, you know, recreation and, and exploitation of others for your own enjoyment. Uh, and I'm afraid of that turning into yet another identity politics issue where the Me Too movement becomes, uh, you know, empower women and denigrate men in general. And it's not about just men in general. Uh, most men are heterosexual, so they exploit women. George Takei and uh, uh, Kenneth, Kevin Spacey are gay, so they were oppressing men, apparently. And, there are female teachers who are oppressing their minor male students and seducing them. So it's, it's across the board, distorted notion of sex. But the Me Too movement and its rise is now in, in my home state, my new adopted home state of Washington, uh, be giving rise to a, an agenda of pro-woman uh, legislation, which will include a mandate requiring every man, woman, and child in Washington state to buy abortion coverage whether they want it or not. Mm. So uh, there are dangers in you know, letting a real issue, a real very serious issue, become just another identity politics where this person is up and this person's down. And I think we just have to call attention to that and say this is not, this is not productive. This just divides the society further and uh, it, it puts some people in the ascendancy temporarily puts other people down, neither one of them is going to be willing to work with the other, and so you never get a solution. And the question is, how are we going to solve the real problem? And that's, you know, saying what your identity is not going to solve that. What's going to solve it is figuring out what the deeper issue is and then working on it. And maybe we can convince a few people that that's the case. That's, Mary? No. Uh, I think we need to understand some of where identity politics is coming from and, and have compassion about it. Um, and, and I speak as a detractor of identity politics, but <clears throat> I think what's happened is that the sexual revolution has so upended the world that people don't have, uh, in many cases, the primal attachments they used to have. They don't identify as son, cousin, boyfriend, um, brother, father. They identify with a group because the home front has been so ruptured for so many people that they can't get a grappling hook into it. And so that's why there's this, this passion to find the right group. Again, getting back to the Weinstein scandals, just to clear my name so I don't go down in history for praising Harvey Weinstein, as you said. No, 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 no. 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 I mean, 
We you, understood. In what kind of world could those scandals happen? With the Me Too movement, in what kind of world could that happen? It's happening in a world where a lot of men don't know what it is to be a protector because they don't have a wife, they don't have daughters. Um, a lot of uh, women don't know what it's like to know men as protectors because they think of them as predators because they don't have a father or cousins or a brother. I mean, the way the sexual revolution has shrunk the family as well as upended it is what's going on at the subterranean level here. And I think we have to really have fellow feeling about that. Yeah. The, uh, we're going to move on to the next question. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Just two, just get in two there. seconds. Uh, you know, I, I don't think identity politics is all bad. It's not always being. Um, you know, it's, I, I was um, prior to the march yesterday. We had uh, a gathering with a few speakers, one of whom uh, happened to touch on identity politics, and she was saying, you know, when I talk about you know the fact that I come from this background and I'm this ethnicity, that's that's information for you so that you can understand how I view the world. And I think it's important to have that information and be able to freely share that information so that people don't just have you know, these these hidden assumptions and then you wind up in the debate and everything is falling flat. You know, if I came onto this stage and all of you just assumed that I was Catholic, this would have been a really weird conversation. <laughs> so, you know, so I think having I think identity politics, you know, it, it's gotten a bad name, but it has at least contributed um, a greater openness to saying, you know, to, to acknowledging differences in perspective, and hopefully that can be uh, a good basis for going forward in a civil manner rather than just, you know, a club to wield that, you know, your, your life was better than mine, so you don't get to say anything. I don't, I don't think that we have to go to that extreme, that identity politics does have something to offer us. Well, and discrimination is real. Yes, if, yes, if, discrimination is real, to be clear. Yeah, yes. <laughs> this is not, if you're a dreamer, you're at risk. If uh, the people who put in the floor in our home the other day, uh, if te temporary protected status goes away, so do they uh, and their families. So I don't know if that's identity politics or reality, but we can find a balance somewhere. Next question. Thank you for receiving my question. My name is Connor Cummings. I am a student at SUNY Potsdam. Um, and the thing I'd like to kind of ask you guys about is uh, Martin Luther King. There seems to be a lot of uh, divisiveness between pro-choice and pro-life people regarding what his views would probably be. Um, people, some people look at the, Mar the Margaret Sanger Award that he received, but um, pro-lifers sometimes look at how, um, so how Margaret Sanger might have been racist or anti-Semitic as well as his religious views that would probably lead him to be pro-life. What are your opinions on him and what stance he might have, be t he might have taken uh, today, if he were alive today? Uh, I might take that. I had the great honor of working for Dr. King's widow, Coretta Scott King, for several years. And to be honest, I don't know uh, where she would have come down in that uh, the, the very much identified with progressive politics, deeply religious, the family. Uh, I'll be honest, here's one where money, we ought to worry a lot about campaign finance reform. The uh, pro-choice movement invested heavily in African American and Latino organizations, and uh, we have not. And uh, the way things work, is they get at least a hearing, and in some cases, they get a vote. And so increasingly, the civil rights community has uh, been defining reproductive rights as a right. I would like to think that Coretta and Martin would have resisted that, but it would have taken a lot. Mm -hmm. the, for me, the test of this, imagine if the Supreme Court uh, took a major step against abortion rights what would happen on the left? What would happen in the Democratic Party? The Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act a year and a half ago. What has happened? Hmm. Where is that as a priority on the left in the Congress? Anybody shutting down the government for that? So I think we can take our inspiration for Dr. King, uh, his deep faith and his ability to put those values in a way that reached everybody, and the idea of nonviolence and a beloved community, 
that includes the unborn child is a great metaphor for us. I think the other metaphor that works for us is Pope Francis uh, warning against the throwaway society. So I don't think we can claim for sure where Dr. King was, but we can say our understanding of his dream includes the unborn child. Thank you. Okay, Hi. next question. My name is Mike, and I have a question about a statement that was uh, proclaimed earlier. It, I believe it was said that more females are aborted than males, and I'm curious, why is that? And is, like, is there a biological reason, just more females in the womb, or is it like something to do with culture? I'm just really curious about that. It, it is cultural, and I, I think she was, uh, I think it was you who said it. it it's, there's some evidence of it happening in the United States, but relatively little. It's, it's mostly internationally, particularly in India and China, uh, where pre there's a strong cultural preference for sons, uh, particularly in China during the, the period of the one-child policy, which has been somewhat relaxed, but still a massive human rights violation. Um, that you know, if a family is told you can only have one child, they want to carry on the family name, they want to have a son, uh, and as a result, uh, girls were selectively aborted. Okay. Uh, we're gonna uh, ask the last three people, and we finally have gotten to a young woman. Uh, <laughs> if you could ask each of your questions, and then I'll ask the panel uh, to uh, respond to one or all of them. I'm Dylan from the University of Dayton. Uh, my question's uh, directed mainly toward Ms. Hazard. Uh, so we kind of ended our whole discussion around like the primary root for us being the sexual revolution and our sex culture in general. And I wonder how you sort of see these arguments coming from a secular sense that that is the root of our problem and like how abortion is the way it is today. How do you see those arguments and how do you take them and use them in your own towards more secular that, ideas? That, that's a great question, thank okay, you. Okay, I'm gonna let the other two right. and then you'll respond. <laughs> uh -huh. Come ahead and my, give my, us my our question. Your question. Uh, so my, my question is, um, so I was not a, a fan of the president during the primaries, I worked hard against him, but I was um, shocked at how pro-life he has become and all the accomplishments he's done and Neil Gorsuch and all the, all the judges that he's appointed and all the pro-life policies. I mean, he's probably the most pro-life president uh, that we've ever had. And so it just shocks me to come to this pro-life conference and instead of talking about those accomplishments, there's a bunch of Trump bashing on the panel. So my, you know, especially after like eight years of a radical pro-abortion administration, completely anti-religious liberty, now we have religious liberty, we have pro-life, and I hear bashing at our pro-life conference. And so my question is just kind of to the organizers, can't we get some diversity on the panel so we can talk about the accomplishments of this administration? So, thank I, you. It, uh, for, uh, I, I was, you got to the question, I mean, Mary clearly talked about her skepticism beforehand and her appreciation for the accomplishments of this administration as did Doctor. I think you need to listen. Uh, question. Uh, Hi, my name is Victoria Karutz and I'm from the University of Dayton. I know we touched lightly on it, but, and we talked about pornography, but what would you all have to say about pornography's effect on our pro-life message and mission? Okay, so I think you might have something to say on the first question. Yeah, uh, so from, from my point of view, uh, you know, it seems to me that you, you, you can go back, looking back into, there, there was never a time when human rights of, of children in particular were universally always honored, right? If you, you can look back into ancient cultures and see unwanted children being killed through infanticide, where today they might be killed through abortion. It's simply a, a matter of improved technology, if, if you can call it that. Um, so I don't know that, that the pro problem really arose in the 60s. I, you know, I, um, I think there's, the, the, the the core issue is simply you know, uh, selfishness and putting your own uh, 
immediate needs uh, over those of a helpless child, or in many cases, um, women being coerced into these kinds of situations, whether that's um, you know, an individual partner pushing for it or you know, broader economic circumstances you know, leading women to think that abortion is their only option. So that's what I generally see as uh, the root of the problem. That being said, I do think that fertility awareness-based methods have a lot to offer uh, for secular people. You know, I'm certainly in favor of not having the side effects of hormonal contraception and um, you know, whatever we can do to give women more um, understanding of their own bodies and healthcare is, is good in my book. I, I think Kelsey is right that, you know, the, the, the lack of respect for the, for the human life for the child extends back centuries. I, and I think to a certain degree, the sexual revolution almost poured gasoline on the fire by, by exploding um, the, the idea of risk-free sex. Um, I wanna address the second speakers. I, I mean, I, I think I, I felt similar to your thoughts when you were speaking about, you know, working against Trump during the primaries and, and having very, very low expectations. And I would agree, I, I have been pleasantly surprised mm -hmm. by how much he has done for the pro-life movement. And I, I am very grateful for that. You know, for me as a mother with four small children, it, it makes it really hard sometimes to talk about, you know, looking at him as a, as a moral leader, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, where it was the difference, you know, with, with, you know, the former President Obama. I mean, I thought his policies were abhorrent. You know, what he did to the Little Sisters of the Poor, what he could have done to us at Catholic Charities. I mean, what he did do to us at Catholic Charities. I mean, we had to stop offering adoption services in Washington, D.C. because of, because of um, the policies of the previous administration. You know, but, but I could at least comment to, well, he, he seemed to have good morals and, and seemed to be a good father. So it's, it's kind of ironic. I mean, the catch-22, I mean, you know, in, in terms of their respect or lack of respect uh, for, for life and, and for being a role model. So, but, but I, I do hear your point and I think it was, it was well made. And I would say that I, I don't think that you are alone out there mm -hmm. um, with people that, you know, may not appreciate who he is um, and the role model he is, but do very much value and appreciate what he has done for the pro-life cause. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any uh, well, I, I only said he was crude, not that his policies are bad, though I disagree with his policies on immigration. Uh, but uh, I, I, I don't like his use of obscenities, just as I didn't like Clinton's acting them. Uh, <laughs> but, but the, uh, you know, I just want to make a, a, you know, a me too about uh, secular arguments in the sexual revolution. Uh, our, our former colleague, Helen Albrey, has done some wonderful writing about what she calls the immiseration of women. And she's one of the people who can always make me go to the dictionary. It just means uh, <laughs> making women more miserable uh, from the sexual revolution. And she's, she has study after study after study about how the mentality created by the sexual revolution has, has, uh, uh, has really uh, made things much worse for women and especially in what's called you know, the marriage market, because any woman who isn't looking for a permanent spouse is, is now pressured to, uh, to engage in, in sexual activity before marriage that she may not want, because otherwise uh, men, who are at least at first, are basically looking for sex, just turn aside and go, go to the women who will give them that. Um, so I, I would recommend her writings on that too, because she's done a lot of research on how, just from a purely secular point of view, this is bad for people and especially bad for women. Okay. Can I come in on the last sure. Sure. question about pornography? And forgive me if I don't remember the exact nature, exact statement of your question, but how has pornography affected this movement? Pornography is a very real issue because what happens with pornography and in viewing these erotic images, it actually changes the brain chemistry of men, such that they require, it's like a drug, such that they require higher and higher doses you know, of the drug, of the visual stimulation, of the physical stimulation. So if they're, if they're, if they're addicted to pornography, and it is an addiction, or it can become an addiction, that will absolutely affect the relationship. And it's just, it's, I mean, for, for the men and women, I mean, it's not just a male issue. Women, women can become addicted to pornography too. I mean, it can be very degrading and debilitating and it's, it's a real issue that we have, to, we have to get at its core. I mean, 
I don't let my 11 year old like have an iPad unless he's in a public place. And I have like every, every you know, uh, parent tracker thing on the iPad. And still he was like looking up something for school and he like came out like shaking, like mom, I just saw something. And I was like, oh, you know, and it, it's, and it can, and thankfully like we have a relationship that he could share it with me and I could help him process that. But for so many kids, you know, they're exposed to pornography at younger and younger ages and they don't have a way to talk about it. So we need to make sure we're addressing it and talking about it. And again, it's about respecting the dignity of the human person, not just the unborn person, but the person that is in this pornographic image that you're viewing, right? And we need to pray for these people and we need, you know, we, we or not. <laughs> 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 I want to be inclusive. You know, we need to make sure we're... We need to support them. We need to support them, them and, and encourage them to choose a better path, um, you know, to respect their own dignity as human beings. So it's, it's a very real issue that, that we need to make sure that we're not ignoring. So thank you for that question. <laughs> I also want to thank you for modeling the behavior of our inclusive movement. Yes. <laughs> uh, you've done Sorry. a lot of work in this area. I was trying to think of saying something about the light side of pornography and nothing was coming through, but then I remembered a story. So I just want to answer that question by way of a story. A few it's years ago, be okay, isn't it? <laughs> it's okay. A few years ago, I was talking to a couple of young women who were college students both progressive, neither religious. And I was asking them about their secular colleges and they both said, you know, the biggest problem out there is pornography. Because we never know when we go out with a guy whether he's seen it, what's the last time he saw it, what's the last thing he saw, etc." And so I said flippantly, you know, too bad that you can't like make a t-shirt that says porn free boy. And, <laughs> hand it out to people who deserve it. And I thought it was funny. They didn't think it was funny at all. And one of these young women said, if they could do that on my campus, a boy like that would have every girl following him around. Mm -hmm. Students take notes. Uh, what's your position on lie detector tests? <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, not scientifically rigorous. Uh, I, in order to bring this uh, to a close, it's been a wonderful conversation, uh, I have asked each of our panelists to provide a tweet. Uh, the Pope tweets, uh, the President tweets, uh -huh. uh, some of us tweet. Uh, my colleagues and my family don't allow me to tweet. Uh, <laughs> but I have a tweet. Uh, so whether it's actually 140 or 280 uh, characters, but give us a short, succinct piece of advice for these remarkable young leaders of the pro-life cause. Begin with. Uh, I wrote, the pro-life movement has great reasons for hope. The trend lines are moving in the right direction and I would not want to be Cecile Richards right now, but that is not an invitation to let up. Here, here. I'll go last. Doctor? I'll go last. Mary? Can I have two? I have two. <laughs> <laughs> I have two. All right. Well, well, to repeat one said before, if you attended both pro-life and pro-abortion marches without knowing which was which, you'd still know instinctively which one you wanted to join. That's a great one. Hashtag Mary knows best. <laughs> And the other, this is for Julia and fellow travelers. Uh, no one would support the abortion of giraffes or elephants. No one should support the abortion of human animals either. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I didn't write that out. Um, okay. This is well, one of the favorite things I've ever done. Richard and <laughs> 280 characters. Oh. <laughs> okay. You can make the pro-life argument simply from biological reality and the basic idea of what it means to have inherent human rights. The rights that belong to you simply because you're a member of the human family. I think 
what is uh, important to add to that, and it doesn't have to be a religious faith. That, that, that. It's <laughs> mm -hmm. a vision of faith that lines up the issues in the view of the world, hope for the future that doesn't get you down, that doesn't let you get down, and approaching everything in love. So. Here, here. So I tweet, but only on my phone. So the, coming up with a tweet without my phone is a little bit difficult. But I would say, remember the two greatest gifts that you've been given, the gift of life and the gift of your ability to create life. Understand your, educate yourself, understand, and grow in appreciation for those gifts, and share that information and knowledge with others. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before I give you my tweet, uh, join me in thanking this wonderful panel. And join me in thanking the wonderful students at Georgetown, led by Michael and Julia, who have put this together. And now, my tweet. <laughs> we are called to be political, not partisan, principled, not ideological, civil, not soft, engaged, not used, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> we should strive to persuade, not condemn, invite, not exclude, win hearts, not wars, be salt, light, and leaven for all life, every life. Hashtag love saves lives. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of our panelists. If we could just give them one more round of applause. Michael and I could think of no one better equipped to moderate this panel than Georgetown's own John Carr. We are so grateful that he could be here today, so thank you again. Good afternoon. My name is Melvin Thomas, and I serve on the board as the director of the Mass for Life. I want to thank you all so much for attending the 19th annual Cardinal O'Connor Conference on Life. However, the day's events are not over yet. Please join us at 5 p.m. in Dahlgren Chapel for the Mass for Life, which will be celebrated by the Most Reverend Leonard Paul Blair, the Archbishop of Hartford. You can get to Dahlgren behind this building by leaving from the first floor and walking through the courtyard. Also, before you leave, please be sure to pick up any of your belongings from the first floor by, by the registration tables. Before we close in prayer, I would like to recognize two people without whom this event would not have been anywhere near as amazing as it has been. For 11 months, our two conference co-directors, Michael Kahn and Julia Greenwood, have put on so much responsibility, have worked so hard, and have spent so much time making this conference bigger and better than ever before. From keeping our board meetings on track to finding our, all of our amazing speakers, from Julia's incredible artist artistic creativity that went into our flyers, our programs, our banners, to Michael's crazy, incomprehensible accounting procedures that, went, that made our conference st stay on budget, they've truly, really outdone themselves. Any statements of gratitude or praise are doomed to be understatements, but I think I speak for the whole board and all the attendees when I say thank you. Thank you for all of your hard work, your sacrifices, your innovation, and your passion for the pro-life cause. And now, I would like to ask them to come up to, to the stage to receive a small token of our gratitude from the board.
Well, while we're doing this, though, I just want to make a special acknowledgement of this guy here, Melvin Thomas, who served on the conference board for four years. Um, I, this is only my second year, so he has the most experience of all of us. So we're so thankful for you, Melvin. At this point, we would like to make a special acknowledgement of the Sisters, of Sisters for Life, who spoke during the breakout sessions and are with us in attendance today. Founded by John Cardinal O'Connor in 1991, the Sisters of Life take a special fourth vow to protect and promote a sense of sacredness of human life. Their missions include caring for vulnerable pregnant women and their unborn children, inviting those wounded by abortion into the mercy of Christ, and um, fostering a culture of life through evangelization. We are honored that they are able to join us each year at our conference, which strives to live up to Cardinal O'Connor's motto, that there can be no love without justice. It is now my distinct pleasure to welcome Sister Jordan Rose of the Sisters of Life to the stage to close our conference in prayer. Thank you. In gratitude for the gift of this day, let us pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving Father, Lord of life, we thank you for creating every person as a wonder. Open our eyes to see life in its deeper meaning, our hearts to receive its utter gratuitousness, its beauty, and its invitation to freedom and responsibility. Grant us an outlook which does not presume to take possession of reality, but instead receives it as a gift, discovering in all things the reflection of you, our creator, and seeing in every person your living image. Grant us courage when confronted by sickness or suffering in our lives and in the lives of those we know. Send your spirit of truth into our hearts that we may find meaning in these circumstances, perceiving in the face of every person a call to encounter, dialogue, and solidarity. Grant us great trust in your merciful love, that we may know ourselves and every person, weak or strong, healthy or sick, to be chosen by you, wonderfully made, and a gift to this world. As we go forth from here today, keep your light of life aflame in our hearts, that we may radiate the truth of the goodness and dignity of every person in our schools, our workplaces, our families, our communities. Strengthen us in the hope that with you nothing is impossible. We ask all this in the holy and saving name of Jesus, who by his cross makes all things new. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.